Okay, hey everyone, let's get started. Welcome to your lecture two of DSC 10. Um, I want to also, I want to point out that we do have a small class today, so um, we'd love to get to know you. If you, want to, if you have some time after lecture and you don't have a class right away, um, feel free to just come up, introduce yourself, just say your name. You don't have to like make small talk with me um, if you don't want to, but um, I would just, it, would just, it would just be great to just know your name, maybe your major, or something about it, uh, something about you, and then um, you can just be on your way. So we'd just like to get to know the other people in the class. And so if you have any questions during class, I'll try to like ask you for your name, um, and I'll try to address you by name while you're, while you're in class. Uh, I do want to preface today's lecture by saying that we will be talking a little bit about COVID-19. Um, I realize that in the past, I haven't been like as sensitive about it as I should have been. And I do want to acknowledge that COVID-19 is like pretty, is, is a major event in a lot of our lives. Um, and for a lot of people, COVID-19 is not just some, like not just some like theoretical thing. A lot of people have had COVID-19 um, and, and a lot of people have had loved ones who have had COVID-19 who have had serious um, conditions or even like deaths from COVID-19. So I just wanted to point that out and if at any point like you feel uncomfortable by what we talk about in class, um, you can just feel free to shoot me an email, and we can find some way to uh, we can find some way to work around it. I think we plan to have one assignment in the class that talks about COVID nineteen, and again, like if if that topic just like makes you feel uncomfortable or you feel like it's really difficult for you to work on it because um, just it's just hard to it's just hard for you to deal with, then um, come talk to me and we'll find some other arrangement for you. So I just want to just want to make sure that. Um, that again, like I don't just gloss over an issue. I don't treat it like it's just some like thing that happened in the past. Um, for a lot of us, it's it's a real problem. All right, so let's go over some announcements. Let me zoom in, make this a little bigger. So everyone in the class should have access to CampusWire and GradeScope now. Um, if not, please email Shivani about it. So this holds um, even if you're on the wait list for the class. I'm aware that some people on the waitlist don't have access to Data Hub um, to access the assignment. So um, we're working on that, and we should have it fixed um, pretty soon by, by this afternoon. If it's not fixed for you, and you're on the waitlist, and you can't get access to Data Hub, um, shoot me an email, and we'll, we'll try to work it out for you as soon as possible. Lab 1 is released, and it's due Saturday at midnight. Um, if you haven't programmed before, it, a lot of the content is going to look very unfamiliar. Um, so um, I would say just try to open it up, and we'll try to we try to guide you through as much of the lab as possible. If you need help, you can post on Campus Wire or come to office hours. Homework one is also released, and it'll be due on Tuesday at midnight. And I also want to give a quick shout out to the syllabus. Syllabus is um, on the course website. It has all the details about course policies. Um, one thing that I didn't mention on Monday that I did want to point out is that um, we do have a slip day policy for the class. Um, so during the whole uh, summer quarter, you'll have six slip days to use for, um, for your assignments. So whether that's labs or homeworks. And the slip days basically will be automatically applied. So what that means is um, over the course of the entire quarter, you can turn assignments up to like six days late in total. So you could do homework one like two days late, 
and then homework two, like three days late, and then homework three could do one day late, and that would use up all your slip days for the quarter. Um, you don't have to email us to use your slip days. Um, what happens is when you submit your assignment late, we'll automatically just take off the number of slip days that, that, you, that you submit the assignment late. So um, it's just a way to help, help you like, just work around stuff that happens during the quarter. Um, and yeah, so, so again, you don't, need to, you don't need to email us if you want to use your slip days. They'll automatically be applied. And there are more details in the syllabus that go over how exactly we like, calculate which assignments to put your slip days on. And so I do re really recommend you read over the syllabus so you, so you understand that policy well. Okay, and just a reminder, I had some emails about this, so um, we're not using Canvas for anything. If you have it, if you don't see uh, DSC 10 appear in your Canvas enrollment, um, don't worry about it. I have you in my system, like, just as an unpublished course, but we're not using Canvas for anything in this class. Okay, um, one more question I saw on Campus Wire is um, people have posted about how there's two DSC 10s listed on Data Hub. Um, I looked into it in more detail, and I found out that the first one doesn't have all the packages we need installed for the assignments. So you may have run into the issue where if you had chosen the first, uh, first server and you tried to run the lab or the homework, you get an error pretty soon after you try to run anything at all. Um, that's because the first one doesn't have the packages we need for the course, only the second one does, and it's the one marked uh, DSC 10 notebook called latest. So what you're really looking for is this latest keyword on the bottom, um, and that's the one that you should choose for your assignments. In today's lecture, we'll be talking about association and causation, and I think it's a really fun lecture because we'll be talking about um, some stories. So the first story I have is, um, well first I have a little story about chocolate, and the next story I have is about London, 1854, and we'll conclude by talking about confounding factors and randomized control experiments. So in, uh, last year, or two years ago, there was an uh, article published in the European Journal of Preventative Cardiology, and um, there is some blog posts or more informal news articles that were published. So, so first there was a research paper, and then people um, from like news websites uh, wrote about that research paper. And this is one of the headlines. So the headline reads, uh, regularly eating chocolate is linked to 8% lower heart attack risk. Okay. And so this word linked is, is a little curious. Um, linked, linked implies like that what we're seeing is that chocolate is related to lower heart attack, um, but really a linked has, a, has an interesting meaning that we're going to go over in this class. Um, I'll first start with some terminology. So in a research study, what we, what we call the individuals, we also call the study subjects, participants, or the units. And the reason why I'm listing out you know, many different names for the same uh, idea is because in this class, I'm going to use them interchangeably depending on the situation. So in this case, um, this study looked at 336,000 um, adults. And what this, the original research paper was actually what we call a meta-study. So it looked at a combination of maybe like 10, between 10 to 20 different research papers and pooled all the results together to try to draw some draw conclusion. The treatment is what we, what um, the people have done, or what we have done to the people as researchers. So in this case, the treatment was chocolate consumption, and these researchers tracked these people, um, these people's lifestyles, and they looked at how many, how much chocolate each person ate over the over the course of some years. The outcome here is heart disease. So what they measured at the end of each each study is um, how many of these people developed heart problems and um, how, does, how the difference compared to people who ate a lot of chocolate and didn't eat a lot of chocolate. So, what we want to ask now is, um, is there any relation between chocolate consumption and heart disease? The technical term for this uh, idea is called association, and association is another way to say any relation or a link between the two. Okay. So here we have some data. In the paper, uh, in the news article, the, the author wrote, researchers examined a total of 336, 289 participants, um, which found that eating any, any kind of chocolate more than once a week was linked with an 8% reduced risk of coronary artery disease. So my question for you is, um, is, there any is there an association between chocolate consumption and heart disease? 
I put up a Menti link here, so um, if, I could, if you could humor me for a minute and just go to menti.com or use your phones um, and, and like, scan this QR code. Over the course of this lecture, there'll be like multiple Menti slides, and if you just hold the Menti tab open in your computer, you don't have to re-scan it or re-enter in the link every time. So um, for this lecture, just like scan it once, have it open on your phone or your laptop, and just keep that open for the rest of this lecture. You, will, you won't have to go back to the website and enter in the code again. A little warm-up question for you. Um, let's take a look. So I'm going to move a little faster to questions today since we have quite a few to get through. Um, it looks like most people said A. I would go with A as well. Um, so when we say that there is, well, let, me reset, let me reset this. To reset. When we say that there's any relation between the two, what we're really saying is, um, did, peop did people who ate more chocolate have a lower risk of heart disease? Okay, so what, what this research studies looked at um, found that there were a lot of people in there were a lot of people in this study, and a bunch of people ate chocolate, a bunch of people did not eat that much chocolate, and that the people who ate chocolate happened to have, on average, um, a lower risk of artery disease. Now, there are other news articles that were published about the same research paper, and these are the headlines for a few of them. So, one of them wrote, chocolate is good for the heart. Another one wrote, is eating chocolate heart healthy? The study says yes. Okay, so these two, these, three, these two headlines are, sound pretty similar to the first one, which said that eating chocolate is linked with a lower rate of heart disease, but they're different in a very subtle way. They're different because they imply that eating chocolate causes less heart disease. And so the difference between the two is that um, in the first case, what they're saying is people who eat chocolate happen to have less heart rate, less heart disease. These headlines, on the other hand, seem to imply that, oh, um, if you eat more chocolate, then your personal rate, of, your personal risk of heart disease is lower. So, the next question is, um, based on the study, or based on what we know a little bit about the study, does chocolate consumption lead to a reduction in heart disease? So, um, here I'll give you three choices. A, answer A if you think, I think so. Um, no, I don't think so. And, pre and answer C if you think, maybe, maybe I need some more information I can't tell. Okay, let's take a look. It looks like the class is a little split between um, no, I don't think so, maybe I can't tell. Um, hmm. Someone want to say why? Oh, someone press D, thank you, whoever that was. <laughs> someone want to be brave and um, explain to me why, someone who pressed maybe, what, why, did you, why did you press maybe? Someone want to volunteer? Yeah, what's your name? What's your name? Peter. Peter, hi Peter. I think it depends on people, some people might that there were more than have to eat chocolate to maintain a good sugar level, but some people cannot eat that much sweet to lead some heart disease. I think it pretty depends. Yeah, okay, so maybe there is, like maybe for some people if you eat chocolate, it does help you, but then you're saying that there are some other people where if you eat chocolate, you might get like diabetes or something. And yeah, like, yeah. Okay, great, great, yeah, hey. Yeah, I was just kind of, I guess, saying some other things, because we don't know the participants, like you don't know if they're at higher risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 that's good. So, what's your name again? Rio. Huh? Rio. Rio? Yeah. Okay, hey, Rio. Nice to meet you. 
Um, yeah, so basically we don't know too much about the participants. Um, maybe the people in the study were already pretty low at, were, were had a pretty low risk of heart disease already, or maybe people had a high risk of heart disease. It's hard, it's hard to really know. Yeah, so again, I think both Peter and, and Rio, you guys are pointing out that there is like other factors that go into having heart disease that eating chocolate may not necessarily um, address. And I think that's pretty true. So I think you two have a great insight. And the article also writes that um, basically it's hard, to, it's hard to decide based on the study alone, right? They didn't actually take people and look at their heart and then give them chocolate and look at their heart again. You see, this study is just looked at, um, historically they took a bunch of people in several different countries and they found that people who eat chocolate also have lower heart disease. But there are some questions that the study leaves unanswered, right? So, of course we know that some people, they don't get to eat chocolate that much. So some people who have like other health conditions like diabetes, if they eat chocolate, they're gonna have a pretty bad time and they're not, they, they just can't eat chocolate that much. The article writes, chocolate appears promising for prevention of coronary artery disease, but more research is needed to pinpoint how much of a kind of chocolate to recommend. So again, um, finding a link between two things is a lot easier than finding, finding out whether um, A causes B. So finding a link between whether chocolate is linked to lower heart disease is, is a different thing to answer than whether eating chocolate um, cause your heart to be healthy. I'll go over this in a little, in a little case study. So we'll go back to 1854, and one of the reasons why we include this example in the course is to, is to show you that data science is not entirely new. Um, the word data science has, hasn't been around for too long, but people have been doing the practice of data science for a long time. And inherently, um, data science to me is about dealing with uncertainty. So in a lot of cases, we want to know in the case of chocolate and heart disease, we're not too sure whether chocolate is linked to a lower risk of heart disease. And we can use data to help guide um, our conclusions on this, on this uh, link between the two things. But at the end of the day, we still don't know for certain. And data science to me is the practice of using data to try to navigate through uncertainty. And we'll see an example of that in 1854 in London. So in this time period, um, people caught disease People got sick, and the reason why people, uh, the reason why doctors thought people got sick, the predominant reason was called um, miasmas. People thought bad smells were the cause, were the reasons why people got sick. Okay, and people who people who believed this um, were called miasmatists. So essentially, this was like, this is like a, this is saying, okay, well, if um, you're around bad smells then you're gonna get sick from the, and it's because you're smelling this bad smell. Because of that, they suggested some um, cures for disease, and these all involved smells. So um, one of them, one person wrote, fly to clean air, so that means move to a place where the air is not as smelly. A pocket full of posies, uh, if you know the nursery rhyme, uh, was what came out of this too. So the idea was like, oh, if you hold some flowers in your pocket, if you have a bad smell, you pull them out of your pocket, give the flowers a whiff, and it'll, it'll help clean your body. Okay. Uh, one person even wrote, fire off barrels of gunpowder. So they, they suggested, okay, well, I really like the smell of gunpowder for whatever reason, so we'll just take a barrel and put it in the, put it in the middle of our town square and light it on fire, and that'll, like, that'll burn off all the bad smells. Okay. Um, now we laugh at this kind of idea now because we know a little bit more about like how diseases actually happen. But at the time, they didn't have microscopes and they didn't understand that there were like invisible um, things or invisible like organisms that could cause disease. And so at the time, there were there were several important people who believed in this idea of miasmas. And one of them was um, one of them was Florence Nightingale, who was um, she was like the founder of modern nursing practices. And another important person at the time was Edwin Chadwick who was, in fact, the, general, the commissioner of the General Board of Health. So he was a person making recommendations to all of England about um, what to do in the case of disease. Okay. Um, one thing I do want to point out is that um, we laugh at these suggested remedies for disease back in the, that they used in the 1850s, um, but 
there are also some like striking similarities to the way that people dealt with COVID when, when COVID first came out, right? I don't know if you remember from like 2020, but at that time everyone was like really panicked about COVID-19 and I just found news articles that were like, you should eat more garlic. And then people were, other people said, don't eat garlic. And people were like, drink tea, and like eat ginger, and like don't eat ginger. Ginger is actually bad for you. So I think it's, I think trying to figure out um, how to like fix a problem is just a very human thing. And when there's something unknown, especially when it comes to disease, like we, we as humans, we just get anxious about it and we try to come up with ideas. So, so again, like I look at this and we laugh and we're like, this is silly, like why would anyone do this? But at the same time, like we should also laugh at ourselves because we did, we did the exact same thing just like two years ago, even though, even though we know a lot more about modern medicine. One of the, um, another similarity between this case study is that in the 1850s, there was a disease called cholera that was really prevalent. And cholera was just this nasty thing where you just, it's like extreme food poisoning and it had a really high fatality rate. And um, people were really scared of this disease because word would get around, right? So you're living in London in the 1850s and you hear a news report, oh, there's some cholera in Germany. No, oh, now the cholera is in France. And then you think, oh man, it's only a matter of time between before cholera, this disease gets to me and where I live and, and what do I do about it? How do I prepare? And then this would, cholera would just kind of go around um, like Europe at the time and cause just really a lot of, a lot of stress and panic for people um, at the time. So again, some similarities with COVID-19. We remember we, we were like, oh man, like first it's in the US. First it's, in, first it's on a cruise ship. Oh, now it's in New York. Now it's in like Italy, and Italy is like, Italy is having a lot of trouble. Now it's in Spain, and now it's back to the US, and now it's Omicron. Again, just, you know, times change, times change, but I think there's, I think people, people don't change that easily. One person around this time who did not believe in the miasma theory, his name is John Snow. He looked like this. Um, he did not look like this John Snow from, from the, what is it, the, the TV show Game of Thrones. So then, not the bottom Jon Snow, the top Jon Snow. He, the top Jon Snow, he didn't believe in miasma. And the reason why he didn't believe in miasma was because he, he looked at where people were getting cholera and he said, well, that's kind of strange because one house, like, you know, three people would die, but the house immediately next to it, no one would die, no one would get cholera. And he just thought, this is really weird, and if it, if it really was caused by bad smells, then both houses should be affected the same way. So he was, he was very suspicious of this idea of miasmas, even though it was very popular at the time. So um, what did he do? He did what is now a very common practice for data scientists. Um, he drew a map. He drew a map of London, and he walked door to door. He knocked on every single door that he could and asked the people there, um, how many people here have died of cholera? So he drew this map, and I'm going to zoom into it. Here it is a little bigger. Let me, let me zoom in. Okay. And his thought was that cholera um, seems to be caused, he, he had the idea that cholera was spread by the water that people drank, not the bad smells. Okay, so he would ask the people, um, did you get cholera? How many people died in this household? And where did you draw your water from? What he did was he looked at, so here we see there's a street called Broad Street, and there's a pump here which we marked in red. So there are several water pumps um, across, this, across London in this time period. And around that time, they didn't have running water, so they didn't have tap water. Instead, like, you would go to the pump with a bucket, you would like, throw in the bucket, and then bring the water back to your house. Okay, so these people will go to these red dots, they'll walk there, get the water, come back to the house. Okay, so what do we see about this map? First thing we see is that there's one pump here, and it looks like a lot of the deaths are clustered around that pump. Right? It's a suspicious amount of deaths that are centered around this broad street pump. The second thing we notice is that, well, this, uh, this house, for whatever reason, had a lot of deaths, which is really unfortunate. Um, and this, like, this to him was like, oh yeah, this, is, this seems to be suspicious, it might be caused by this pun. But then he looks at some other places. Okay, so let's look at this place. This is a workhouse. Um, this workhouse is a place where 
if you get if you become like a if you're a criminal and you get caught you go to jail this is where you get sent to do like manual labor okay so this is the workhouse and this workhouse even though you expect the conditions to be very bad you like people don't have money in this place they probably don't have the cleanest conditions um, they have a very they have a small number of deaths of cholera okay and so he went there and he looked at he investigated this place and he found out that the workhouse um, actually had their own water source Okay, they had their own water pump, and they didn't go to this Broad Street pump to get water because they had enough people here that um, they built their own pump. Um, this is very hard to read, but this little building is marked a brewery. There's a brewery here. Um, and there's no deaths in the brewery, even though it's kind of located right next to the pump. Why, why might that happen to you? Any guesses? Any guesses for why the why the brewery didn't have any cholera deaths. Yeah, what's your name? Uh, Joel. Hey, Joel. Um, they probably didn't drink any water from the tap because they were at a brewery. Yeah, they were probably just drinking <laughs> beer or something, right? They were just drinking beer only and they didn't. Well, actually, I think the reason was because um, they had their own pump too, because um, they needed water for their business, so they didn't want to go to the public pump and, and draw their own water. So they had their own, they had their own water for their business. OK. And he really did a lot of bed work. So John Snow, he looked at. Um, all these houses that are out in the middle, like far away from the pump, that still had cholera deaths. And he investigated every single one. So there was one, one notable case where there was a um, family living like, you know, a very great, like, a good distance away from the pump, from the Broad Street pump, where it didn't really make sense for them to get water from the pump. And, and still that family had two deaths. Um, and he found out that this uh, family had recently moved um, to another part of town, but the grandma did not like the, wa the taste of the water from that part of town. So what her family did every day was go to the pump and bring back some water for, for their grandma. Okay, so he did a lot of legwork and he found, out, um, he found out that in every single case of cholera, at least in this part of London, um, all the cases could have been linked back to drinking water from the pump. So he went to the mayor of the, of the town, and he said, hey, you got to take the handle off this pump because like, this, evidence, like, this evidence to me seems just, just all the fingers just point at the pump. Let's just take it off and see what happens. And so um, at the time, the wave of cholera was kind of declining already, but um, they thought that taking the to pump, they took the pump, um, sorry, they took the handle off the pump and they, they thought, they think that this prevented like future waves of cholera from breaking out in this town. And this sort of investigation is kind of like what we call the first example of epidemiology, which is the study of how diseases spread. Okay, so in 1850, this guy named John Snow, he thought, miasma is not, not right, might be something in the water, let me investigate. He did the legwork, he, he found the data, he drew a map, and he convinced other <coughs> people that what he saw in the data was, was a real pattern. He took, the pump, he took the handle off the pump, cholera stopped happening, and everyone was really happy. And so now, um, oh man, this, this image is really big. Uh, right now, this street right here, it's called something different now. I think this street is called a Broadwick Street instead of Broad Street. But this street is still around in London. And if you actually go to this street, you can go to this little pub called John Snow. It's the pub right on the corner where the pump was. Um, it's named in his honor because he's considered just like the, one of the founders of epidemiology. And if you go there, you'll see this water pump here. It doesn't work anymore, but what do you notice about it? You notice that there's a spot here where the handle should, should be, but there is no handle now. Okay, so even today when um, people are studying the spread of disease or, or people are trying to figure, figure out like what's going wrong with this, with this analysis, people will say, where, where is the handle to this pump? Now, John Snow looked at his study, um, and even for him, he realized that what he did was not enough to establish causation. Because even though he took the handle off the pump, people could argue that, well, the wave of cholera was already declining. Even if he didn't take the handle off the pump, number of deaths or cholera would have gone down anyway. There could have been some other factor at work that 
I mean, didn't that you just did you thought was that water, but it was really maybe maybe to clean up the streets better that week, and that this that bad smells went away. And so he um, he basically had to like address his haters. There were people who did not want to believe in this in this theory of Jon Snow because they were they just thought, yeah, miasmas, miasmas are totally a thing. Like every time I go out the street and it's like there's rotten trash in the street, people are getting sick left and right, and that just seems to be like the reason why people are getting sick. So. What he did was, he looked at the water supplies in London. Okay, so at the time, there were two main water companies in London. One of them was called Southwark and Vauxhall, and the other one was called Lambeth. So these two water companies, and the areas on the map show where the two different water companies serviced water to the people living there. And the key to Jon Snow's investigation was this patch in the middle here, where both Southworks and Vauxhall and Lambeth um, gave water to the people who were living there. One key thing for his argument was also to note that um, there is no like there is no systematic way by which these two companies divided up which which houses they serve. The houses at in the towns um, essentially were they essentially were able to like pick between. Um, one or the other. Like one city would choose one of the companies, another city would choose another company, and there was no, like the companies didn't decide who got what water. It was just up to the cities themselves. And because of that, um, what Jon Snow realized was that the, the differences in the houses, differences in the cities, um, were like, they were kind of like mitigated by random chance. So even if, um, even if there was a, re a really rich town in the middle of London and a really, uh, really poor town, when he found out that between house to house, um, the, the water that each house got was essentially like at random. So what, he's, what he decided was that each house could pick either one and they, they essentially did it based on the flip of a coin. Now, the, difference, the main difference between these two companies is one of them, Mammoth, Drew the water from the river Tom. I don't know how, I never know how to pronounce this. Does anyone know how to pronounce this? It's like Tom's. It's not, it's not Thames. It's, I think it's Tom's. So, um, Lambeth drew their water upstream of the river Tom's. Downstream, there is some pollution that was dumped into the river. So some places would dump their sewage into the river. And then downstream from that was the main water supply for S and V. Okay, so one company, drew their water and it was clean. Another company drew their water and it might have had sewage in, in the water. And again, like, we're like, oh my gosh, that's disgusting. But at the time, they didn't know. They just thought like, well, we just throw our poop in the, in, in the ocean and it gets, all gets washed away, so why can't we do the same with the rivers? It, sh it should be fine. Okay, so let's talk some terminology. We call the treatment group um, a group that does receive the treatment for a particular research study, and the control group is a group that does not receive the treatment. My discussion question for you is to figure out which house um, in John Snow's study we call the treatment group. Okay, so answer A if you think all the houses in the region of the overlap, um, answer B if you think houses served by the dirty water, and answer C if you think houses served by Lambic, the clean water in the region of the overlap. So go ahead, go to Menti and answer that question. See what you thought. Okay, looks like some people said A, some people said B, some people said C. Uh, no real consensus here. It's a little bit of a trick question because to me it kind of depends on how you frame the research study. So if you thought that, um, if you think that like getting dirty water is the default 
is a default for people living in London, then you would think that the clean water is a treatment. If you think that clean water should be the baseline and giving people dirty water, you want to you want to measure cholera, then you would say that um, giving people dirty water is, is a treatment. So in this case, I would actually go with either B or C. Um, you could argue A as well, if you think that just having people drink water in general is a treatment. Um, so it really depends. Honestly, I think all three answers could be um, could be correct depending on how you frame how you frame this experiment. Um, for John Stone's particular case, I would I think he was leaning a little bit more towards um, Lambeth water is clean, so that's the control, and then pe giving people uh, water that may have been contaminated with sewage is a treatment because then he could measure um, how these how this contaminated water affected out health outcomes for these people. Okay. John Snow wrote um, one important note, which allowed him to draw a conclusion about causality. So he drew, he wrote up, there is no difference whatever in the houses or the people receiving the supply to two water companies or in any of the physical conditions with which they are surrounded. Okay, so what he meant here was that it's not the case that rich people get Lambeth and poor people get s &D, or the other way around. What he's saying is um, across, the, across the places where the two water companies serve water, um, the house, the two population of houses look pretty much the same. So people were about evenly distributed, rich and poor. People were about evenly distributed, like living in a good neighborhood versus bad. People were about evenly distributed, um, like maybe like ethnicity. Okay, so what he was pointing out here is that the two groups, in every way that he could tell, were exactly the same, except one group got clean water and one group got sewer water. This is a key idea that lets us say whether one thing causes another. Okay. If the two groups were different in some systematic way, then we don't know whether the outcome was caused by the dirty water or by some other factor. So maybe it's that, so it could have been that if only rich people got one water company and poor people got another water company, um, you could still argue that the poor people got more cholera because some other thing was wrong with their living conditions and it wasn't necessarily the water. But if you know that two groups are similar or nearly exactly the same, except for the treatment that you give them, then you can say, well, the difference in outcome, the difference in cholera numbers is caused by the dirty water and not by anything else. So, John Snow counted up number of people, number of houses, sorry, um, that drew water from the two companies. You count the number of cholera deaths between the two different, uh, two different houses. And he looked at the deaths per 10,000 houses because the number of houses is different in each, in each um, supply area. So what we, wanna, what we really wanna see is the number of the rate of cholera deaths between the two houses. Okay, so um, take a look at this table, study it for a minute, and then try to answer this question um, from this table, can John Snow conclude that dirty water causes cholera? Yeah, John. Uh, it's not letting me vote. It still says that. Oh, says, yeah. shoot. Okay, hold on. Here we go. All right, reset. Okay, try now. Sorry about that. Cool. We'll go back. Go back here.
Okay, let's take a look. Okay, so it looks like most people said A, some people said B, some people said C. Um, I think in this case, what we're looking for here is the deaths per 10,000. And we're looking at the difference in the deaths per 10,000 across the two different companies. So we see that S&V, which had dirty water, had about 300 deaths per 10,000 houses. Lambeth, which had clean water, had um, 37. It's a difference of like, so basically what John Snow noticed was that S&V has about 10 times the number of deaths than, than Lambeth. So for him, this was like, a pretty clear evidence of, okay, well, dirty water seems to cause cholera. Houses that get dirty water have more cholera cases and more cholera deaths than places with clean water. Yeah, question. How about for the rest of London? They've got plenty of number of houses, but we don't know if it's a dirty or clean water. But the deaths is still pretty nice, a little bit more than the clean water. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Can you remember your name again? One more time? Peter. Peter, that's right. So, so Peter says, well, what about the rest of London? Peter? Yeah, because that's why I choose B. Yeah, yeah. So the rest of London has a lot of houses um, and also seems to have a low number of deaths per 10,000. Well, the truth is, in this case, um, right here, John, we don't know too much about the rest of London and whether or not they got dirty or clean water, as, as you pointed out, right? So. Um, it's hard to draw a conclusion about the rest of London if we're trying to answer the question of does dirty water cause cholera? It looks like in this case, what I would expect is if the rest of London got dirty water, then their death rate would be higher. But in this case, this suggests to me that mo it looks like the rest of London got mostly clean water, maybe some other, some other water companies got dirty water, but most of the water companies had clean water. Yeah. But, yeah. From this, love, from this row alone, we don't really know. Um, what is clear is that the one company that we know does have dirty water has a very high death per 10,000, and the rate of deaths is much higher than the rest of London. So although we don't know too much about the rest of London, it does seem like even compared to the rest of London, dirty water causes the cholera death rate to be much higher than, than the rest. Yeah. Um, Rio, did you have a question? Uh, no. I guess I'm just going to ask that there's a lot more houses in the rest of London, even though the chlorine deaths are the same, it's way more than deaths in the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are a lot more houses in the rest of London. Um, the interesting thing about statistics, and the one, the one thing that I think is like really cool about statistics is that with statistics, you can draw conclusions about really big populations, even from a relatively small sample. And what that means is, you look at these two numbers and you think, well, there's only a few houses here relative to the rest of London. At the same time, you can use statistics to make to say, well, even though this pattern we only saw in a small sample, um, because these two groups looked about identical except for the dirty water, we can still draw conclusions about the rest of London and what, what is a real underlying cause of cholera. Okay, any questions about this, about the material so far? Okay, so main takeaway from today. Okay, if you want to establish causality, you need to make sure that the treatment and control groups are as similar as possible aside from the treatment. So you want to eliminate all the possible ways that, that the outcome could be affected, um, all possible differences between the two groups except for a treatment. If you can establish this, then you can say um, the difference between outcomes is caused by the treatment and not just linked to the treatment. It's hard to eliminate all the other factors, though, that go into that, that may appear between the two groups. So it's, um, it's especially difficult to eliminate these factors in what we call observational studies. Um, in an observational study, what we're doing is essentially looking at historical data. So what happened in the past? That was true for the chocolate um, research, research studies that we saw earlier in this lecture, where the researchers looked at, well, like, look, they looked at past data, they looked at what people did, but the researchers themselves did not tell people to eat chocolate or not eat chocolate. Um, the people themselves chose whether to eat chocolate or not eat chocolate. So because of that, we call that study an observational study because the researchers are observing 
their units or observing their participants and not interacting with them in any way. These studies often have, um, often result in differences between treatment and control because um, as we talked about earlier in the lecture, it may, it may be the case that people who um, had higher risk of like diabetes did not eat as much chocolate. There could have been cases where people who um, couldn't afford to eat chocolate that much just didn't eat chocolate that much. So there, there are many ways that, uh, many possible confounding factors here that may have caused, uh, that may have been the real underlying reason behind why people got lower heart disease. So again, in an observational study, um, we usually cannot conclude that A causes B. If we, see a, if we see a link between the two, then we can conclude, okay, well, these two things are associated or linked together, but that's not the same thing as saying that A causes B. Okay. Let's see, how am I doing on time? Okay, let's keep going. Let's get through the rest of the slides. In, um, so it's pretty hard to eliminate all the possible confounding factors that go into an experiment, um, but one of the best ways to do so is, what, is with randomization. So if we assign individuals to treatment and control at random, then we know that the, the two groups are likely to be similar apart from the treatment. So what that means, what this really precisely means is that if we randomly assign, so not by just not by just dividing the class in half, but if I actually took the list of people in this class and flipped a coin for each person to assign them to treatment or control, then we can conclude that the two groups are likely to be similar. And we can, more importantly, we can quantify exactly how much we think the two groups will be different. And that's the key idea behind what makes statistics work um, for drawing conclusions about populations, is because we can Use the, we can use ideas from math and statistics to, to actually say that this statement is true. We call these experiments randomized controlled experiments. So they use randomized, researchers use randomized controlled experiments, for example, to um, determine like, how well the, the COVID-19 vaccine worked. Right? So if you signed up for a research study, which I did not but I kind of regret because they paid pretty good money for it and they, like, you would be able to get the vaccine a little earlier, but if you signed up for their vaccine study, what they would do is they would randomly assign you to one of two groups. One group would just get a shot that had like nothing in it, like salt water, and the other group would actually get the vaccine. And then they measured, they measured the, the COVID-19 rate between the two groups. Because they randomly assign people to the two groups, they can, they can actually conclude that their vaccine causes COVID-19 rates to be less, or co causes COVID-19 symptoms to be less severe than they would otherwise be. All right, uh, let's see, do I have time to go over this? I think I have time to go over this last question. So let's try this just to, just to um, test your knowledge here. So we want to assign people to treatment and control at random. Which of these three questions cannot be answered by using a randomized control of the experiment? Okay, so check it out. Oh, let me reset the, reset the thing here. Reset, let me get better at this. Okay, there we go. Let's take a read over. Um, we'll give you one minute since we're almost at time. And we'll wrap up by talking about which of these cannot be answered. Let's take a look. A lot of people wrote C or D. Um, sorry again, it's a little bit of a trick question because in this case, it's we could do um, we can do A and B using a randomized control experiment. We can also do D if we talk to parents like while their kids are being born and randomly assign people to play classical music. Um, 
C, we technically can imagine a case where we, tell, where we randomly tell people to smoke or not smoke. But today, if we did that to people, people would be like, well, like, smoking, I know smoking is bad for me, so why are you doing something that's bad for me? It's actually unethical to, to knowingly give people a treatment that um, may cause them like, to become unhealthy in the future. Okay? All right, that's it for today. On Friday, we'll talk about programming in Python. See you next time. So, hey, what's up, Joe? Yeah. Yeah, Joe. So, I uh, have a TA message here about the Jupyter code. I've like, all the other class courses that I was enrolled in, it would come up, except for um, this course. I think it's because it might be I'm on the wait list. Okay, okay, okay. Um, can you shoot me an email just to remind me to get to it? And then we'll try to make sure that you can get access to it. All right. And then, um, one last question. Do you know when the wait list runs? Like, to what day? Ooh, that I do not know, actually. I don't know. I don't know too much about it. You might have to, um, can you, can you maybe email someone from the device? Is there like a email? I think they on the back, like you could uh, ask. Yeah. Like, I'll, I'll do that then. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm not too sure about like the exact logistics. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll just email yeah. you on this yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's your name? Sean. Sean. Do we have Canvas on now? Um, so we're using Canvas for this course. Um, so uh, what you want to make sure you do have access to is CanvasWire and Gracebook. And data hub. Those three things are the things that we're using for this course. Um, we're not using Canvas for anything. Um, it, I, we do have your names in Canvas, like behind the scenes, but we're not using. We just haven't turned on Canvas because um, we don't post anything on Canvas. Oh, I'll use this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, what's your name? Andrew. Andrew. Okay, Jimmy. Your last time, right? Yeah. yeah. I have a question on the Jupiter Hub. The Jupiter Hub. Is she not in the? Oh yeah. If you're on the wait list. Yeah. Um, I think right now because people don't have access to Data Hub, but we're we're gonna fix that later too. So. But if uh, the the lab and homework is gonna do soon, if she cannot get in that like the normal do, 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 does she gotta extend it? Um, we can talk about it if if you feel like there isn't enough time. But um, I feel like lab one the homework is easy. It should be. Lab one is supposed to be able to do based on Friday's like uh -huh. based on Friday's lecture because we haven't gone over the actual like yeah. content for lab one yet. So the way we try to design it is so that you can finish it on Friday after the lecture and have it have it turn it on Saturday. So um, we think that there there should be enough time to finish it. But um, if you feel like if you do feel like it, um, data hub like data hub not being available as like has like caused problems for you, just let me know and we can try to work something out. So. Can you also email me? Um, just email me saying like, "Hey, I'm Judy. Talked about being on the wait list. So I just have your name down to make sure that." I think he's with this one. It should be no problem. Yeah. Yeah. So send me an email to remind me, um, and then when when we do add you to Data Hub, um, we'll email you again to see if we can try it. Then. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. It's um, Joel, right? Yep. How's it going? Uh, going good. I'm actually at a bit of a crossroads where I'm not sure what major I want to pursue. Mm -hmm. And obviously I'm considering data science. I was wondering if I would be able to talk with you like about your experience with the field and like yeah. what I would expect with that. Should I like come into office hours or meet outside of that or what? Yeah, let's do that. We just drop into office hours. Um, office hours are Fridays, yep. one to three. So we can make it out. Um, if you can make it out, I'm with campus for the summer, so. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, All right, yeah. I'll talk yeah. to you about Choosing, that. deciding what majors to do is it pretty is normal. Terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> <no>. Freshman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. I don't. I was uh, literally going to ask the same question. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, is it just, real with the R? Yeah, it's a Rio. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> That's me. Yeah. But I'm a psych major right now, but I was okay. thinking of switching to data science. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I took uh, intro to stats and I also took intro to Python. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, these are like the most fun classes I've had. Oh, really? Yeah, and I took linear algebra. I was like, okay, this is also the most fun class. Oh, really? Maybe I should think about switching majors. That's pretty uncommon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>